Professional C Sharp in .NET with Philip Japixi. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast, deliver quality, and run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything that the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure, a software architecture company that empowers .NET teams to be self-sufficient and able to deliver world-class results through its ClearMeasure Way methodology. Uh, my architect forums are going strong, by the way. Signups for the next session are up. And if you lead a software team and are looking to collaborate with peer architect leaders, then you can sign up at the link in the show notes. And for those looking for Programming with Palermo, my video podcast, just search in any of the directories and, and you'll find it. My guest today on the show is Philip Japixi. Um, he is an international speaker, Microsoft MVP, ASP Insider, Microsoft Certified Solutions Developer, PSM2, PSD, PST, and all these other acronyms, and a passionate developer of the developer community. Um, he's been working with .NET since the first betas and uh, developing software for over 35 years and heavily involved in the Agile community since 2005, as well as a professional scrum trainer. Phil has taken over the best-selling Pro C Sharp books from A Press. And that includes uh, Pro C Sharp 10. He's the president of the Cincinnati.NET Users Group and the Cincinnati Software Architecture Group. Uh, Co-hosted the Hallway Conversations podcast for a long time. Founded and, and he currently runs the Cincy Deliver Conference. And he volunteers for the National Ski Patrol. During the day, Phil works as the CTO for Pintas and Mullins. Phil always enjoys uh, learning new tech and is always striving to improve his craft. You can follow Phil on Twitter at SkiMedic, S-K-I-M-E-D-I-C, and read his blog at SkiMedic.com slash blog. Most of his sessions can be found on SessionEyes.com slash SkiMedic. Phil, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Now that you've read my bio, do we have time for a show or are we out of yep, time? Now? All out of time. <laughs> Maybe I need to shorten that a little bit, huh? Well, you know, when we start out talking about how you've been been at this programming thing for 35 years, there's bound to be <laughs> bound to be a lot there. So you have the been there, done that resume. Yeah, I joke with my team that I've probably written everything, you know, a solution to everything you can throw at me, but I'm old enough and doing this long enough that I can't find a solution. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like you to kind of talk about your background and how you moved into not only programming, but this type of programming that you're focusing on now, because it, it just, anyone can go on Amazon and, and just right there, there's 10 different book titles that are listed there. And then you search on YouTube and find all kinds of sessions that you've spoken at and conferences and of course, user group leadership. So you've done a, a ton, but just for the listener, what were the, what were the key points that you think kind of steered you along your career to focusing on what you're focusing on today? There's a couple of things that happened, I guess, that were watershed moments in my career and some I was involved with and some I just picked up on. And, and one of the big ones early on was Com Plus. And, and when you're working with classic ASP, I don't even know if we call it that anymore. No, that's what Microsoft but the calls old, it. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the old BB ASP, you know, active server pages. And, you know, it, it's certainly didn't grow up in a Microsoft world, uh, did lots of different languages throughout my career. And so I work on a project, a web development project that and I, I had familiarity and done some work in VB before um and it was management had to decide whether or not to rewrite this site in c plus plus or vb and asp and i had taken time to learn pretty extensively mts microsoft transaction server mm -hmm. um, which later became known as com plus 
and found out that you can write really, really fast responding pages in the VB world. And you could also deliver in a third of the time as a C++. And management didn't believe it. So I said, fine, let's just do it. Give us a week and we can see what we can build. And, and we built a much, much more content in that week. And it was just as responsive as the C++. So the decision went with, you know, the Microsoft, you know, the VBASP solution. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of just, you know, tossed my hat in the ring and said, I'm all Microsoft now. Uh, .NET came along and revolutionized everything. And and the book that you uh, that you mentioned, the Pro C Sharp book on A Press, I didn't found that book. Andrew Trollson found that book, and you know I still have every edition, a, a hardbound copy of it. And so I just, you know, he came out with the 1.0 book in 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. and I read it cover to cover, right? And then every time he came out with a new book, I read it cover to cover and decided to go deep into the Microsoft world. And one of the best things about the book, um, and I've tried to keep this, you know, moving forward when I took over with C Sharp 7, was that it's, it's deep in certain areas, but it's broad in others. And so it's like, here's all the stuff you can do. Now you need to go research, you know, get deeper, but at least you're aware, right? Mm -hmm. As a consultant um, and an architect, for sure, you need to be aware of what your platform can do. You don't need to be an expert in all that, but at least need to know that, hey, I've got this. You said you used to drive a Jeep and maybe you never drove it off road, but you had to know that it was capable of going off road. Right. So in case mm -hmm. you needed that capability. Um, and so that was that was instrumental in getting me even deeper and better, you know, better gigs, frankly. And then I had done a lot of classroom teaching, you know, through my career. And I remember. Uh, this must be .NET 1.1 1 .1 or so, a friend of mine here in Cincinnati was running a code camp and had somebody drop out, right, last minute. And it was on the data access blocks, which I actually had been part of yes. creating. Um, so I was on a project up here with a lot of Microsoft consultants. I, I helped write the C Sharp language specification and, and coding standards, not the language specification, the coding standards. I was very involved in that group. And so my friend reached out and said, hey, I had somebody drop out. I know you know the data access blocks, you worked on them and come give a talk. And so I gave a talk at this local code camp and it was horrible. It was death by PowerPoint. It was, I, I went into it like a classroom instructor. Mm. And, and that's not what I took away from it. I sat in the in the speaker room and I looked around the room and I'm like, this is where I want to be, right? I've long been been a fan of of advocating don't be the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And 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 not not to say I'm the smartest person, but as a consultant, you tend to be, right? Because they're hiring you because you know more about the subject area than the customer. And so it's your job to train them up and then you move on to the next, right? But then who do you go to for advice? And, and sitting in the speaker room, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, this is where I want to be. So I spent the next two summers. And it's funny because some old-time speakers and I just had dinner last week and we're talking about this. Couch surfing, sharing rooms, sleeping in cars. You know, in, in that time, the other 2000s, at least here in, in what was called Heartland, which is Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, you know, from spring to fall, you couldn't throw a rock and not hit a code camp. Mm -hmm. So I was out every weekend, you know, just driving, putting miles on the car and, and honing my craft and getting better at speaking and and got to be involved in bigger and bigger events and, you know, therefore being surrounded by smarter and smarter people. And it was awesome. Um, fast forward to, I don't remember what the year was, but I had... I've been called in to help. Well, my first foray into writing was with somebody from Columbus who asked a, a, a colleague of mine and I to write the WPF chapters for his book and said, oh, we'll get you on the contract. We'll work it out later. And then so we wrote these chapters for his book. And I said, hey, you mentioned getting us on the contract. And he said, no, I never said that. Mm. And uh, totally screwed me over. Um, but it taught me an important lesson in publishing and that you don't lift a finger until you have a contract. It's just a very <laughs> different world. And honestly, right, same thing with consulting or even just employment, right? You should always have a contract in place. 
Um, I got called into an A-Press book because of that experience. You know, I, my name was kind of out there, but I got called in to bail out a book that two people that I knew from, from my, my day job had started and never finished. And I bailed that book out and then I got an A-Press's radar. Mm -hmm. And when Andrew wanted to leave writing, at least leave writing about C-Sharp, he'd you know, been there, done that kind of thing. Um, A-Press called me and mm -hmm. had a conversation with Andrew. We talked about it. And that C-Sharp 6 book, we split. C-Sharp 7, I took over completely. And I've been the, the number one person maintaining it. Um, and you're an author. So fun fact, to get my name above Andrew's or even next to Andrew's on the cover, is a Library of Congress change, okay? Uh, which is why, even though he's not involved, and I, he's, his name will always be on the cover, yeah. mind you. Um, but we can't put my name first because of the way Library of Congress has its rules. Because it's an addition, not a new title, right? Right. Yep. Yep. So, well, hey, he he did a lot of work to get that going. So, oh no, he Probably did. Was... He did. You know, I I inherited an awesome franchise, and and it's a ton of work. It's a labor of love to keep it going, and you know, you can get the the latest uh, C sharp ten book right now. Uh, we opted not to do a C sharp eleven book, and and we should probably just talk about that if we, if you give me a few minutes. Mm -hmm, there, sure. The biggest change in the .dot net world these days, and we dropped the core moniker, right? So it's not .dot net core, it's just .dot net. Mm -hmm. Is the the difference between the long term support and short term support, right? So short term support versions, those are the odd number versions. That's going to be, you know, .dot net seven, C sharp eleven, uh, .dot net five, which is already out of support. They're only good six months after the next release. Microsoft's doing annual releases. So that means the odd numbered version is only good for 18 months. Mm -hmm. The even numbered versions outlast the odd numbered versions. So .NET 6 will outlast .NET 7. Mm -hmm. .NET 8 will get released in November of this year. It will last three years. Right? So we're going to have .NET 6 and .NET 8 parallel support parallel supports not the right word supported concurrently before c sharp you know 10 goes by the wayside and dot net six falls out of support it is a ton of work to create a new edition and honestly when you look at the content of what changed between dot net six and dot net seven there's a lot of performance improvements mm -hmm. right but from a book like I always say, there's performance improvements, so I don't go into great details. There's not a ton of content. And and frankly, it, it's not worth the effort and the marketing to put out a book that's only going to last 18 months. Yeah. There's like, what, three C-sharp features that you could kind of add in there? Or maybe maybe there's, there's a few more of it. Well, there's the, the main one is uh, raw string literals, right? where you can have as many quotes as you want. Yeah. Uh, a couple of small things. There's a lot of changes in EF core and it would have been worth writing about that. Um, but I'll cover that in the, in the .NET 8 book. Yeah. So, and the static, uh, static interfaces, that one right there, yeah. I've already started putting to use. I mean, I think we're learning where it should be used, but in certain situations, I, I found that to be really handy. It, it can be, especially working with legacy code. Um, I I guess I'm a little academic in that realm where it's like, hey, you ruined my interfaces, right? You got your peanut butter <laughs> or my chocolate. Yeah. Um, and, and not many people listening to your podcast will probably remember those commercials. But yeah, it's um, it, it, and it goes back to the old ad. It's just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? You know, there's there's a proclivity in this business that when a new feature comes out you got to find a way to use it right now i have a hammer i got i've got to find that nail or, mm -hmm. or make everything look like a nail and that's something that you know there's so much in c sharp and it's funny because i have um so my employees i i give them a free copy of the book and i suggest that they read it because you know there's great content in there about oo and and you know just the, the core features of, of c sharp and i remember I was working with one of my new employees and I'm looking at the code. I'm like, that's interesting. Where'd you pick up that technique? He goes, um, your book. <laughs> I'm like, oh, nice. oh yeah. I mean, that's what I kind of joked in the beginning. There's so much in there that it's easy to forget, you know, and that's one of the nice things about going through because every edition, it's not just slapping in new features, right? It's also 
go back and make sure all the old code samples work. Mm -hmm. um, when we got top level statements and you know global usings and implicit global usings, I literally went and rewrote all of the code samples, mm -hmm. right? And and the interesting part there is just by taking out the curly braces, I averaged about three pages per chapter that I reduced the book by. Yeah. Just just from curly braces, yep. right? And removing using statements. You know, so there's so much there. And and it's, you know, at, at some point in time, it's like, do we just need to get it done or do we need to get it done fancy? Um, I still use ReSharper, uh, even though ReSharper and Visual Studio seem to hate each other. Um, and I understand why. It's it, it certainly, you know, when you fire up a solution, if you got ReSharper installed, you might as well get a cup of coffee. But once you're in it, I still find it to be hugely productive. Mm -hmm. But some of the refactorings, like with the patterns, and patterns are cool, but then it'll, it'll make a suggestion, and I'll, I'll say, all right, let's try it. And I'll look at the code, and it becomes impossible to read. Right. And that supportability is also very important. Right. So I'd rather have a few more lines of code to make sure that when I come back to it, I'm like, oh, I know what this is doing, mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at it going, I have no idea what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Right. And just have to write a unit test around the pattern to make sure I understand it. Right. And, you know, just as generics were new when they came out you know the patterns will become second nature to most of us but yeah i just caution It'll you know against while. getting too cute right mm -hmm. in your code and, and let's just make sure it works yeah that kind of goes with everything back when powerpoint was new you had all kinds of animations flashing everywhere everything was a different color <laughs> everything moved and now almost 30 years later PowerPoint presentations, some of them are really boring. Just let's put something up there and leave it. <laughs> you know, with my talk, and I still do a ton of talks with VS Live, and, and I have very long PowerPoints that I don't show, mm -hmm. right? Because the way I look at it is that there's your reference material for my talk. Mm -hmm. And so what I tend to do is I will have, unless there's some concept that I really want to show in isolation, right? Um, I'll just have on a separate monitor, I have the PowerPoint. And for me, it's just a reminder of, hey, did you cover these things? Yeah, good point. But yeah, I remember the days of having the uh, the transitions and the the page flip and everything else. And yeah, occasionally I'll go back and, and I'll be looking. I'll, I'll go back and look at an old presentation and, and pull it up and you know, hit the, the space bar to go to the next slide. And go, oh, no, I got to remove the trans <laughs> the animations first thing. Right. Well, you are the. CTO for a private company, and Correct. yeah, I think there's there's plenty of uh, plenty of fodder for the stereotype of the CIO or the CTO of a of a fairly decent sized company that that kind of really doesn't understand what the programmers do. But but you're different because you you got to the level what I'll call a master programmer, and now you oversee software operations in, in your company. How do you think about the software executive role? Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self-sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. Clear Measure is also happy to be a sponsor of the video podcast, Programming with Palermo. Watch, learn, and program alongside Chief Architect Jeffrey Palermo. Videos are added weekly and available on syndicated locations supporting video podcast or by visiting palermo.network. Tune in today. Well, I think of it differently than most. I've I've been involved in a couple panels, even just, you know, Zoom calls with CIO clubs or CXO clubs, as I call it. And I realize I'm very different. I'm still coding every day, right? Mm -hmm. I'm still developing software. I'm in the weeds uh, with everybody else, right? Um, I was, you know, a big part of, 
of the the software release we just did. We just did a humongous release. And I know, oh my gosh, how's your work? You're not supposed to do big releases, but when you're replacing existing software, you can't do just incremental releases, right? You have to at least get them back to the point they were before. So I look at it as as I am in the trenches with my employees, right? I would never ask my employee to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Um, I'm in there, I'm, I'm slinging code, I'm making mistakes alongside them, right? And hoping they that we catch each other in, in pair programming sessions and, and peer reviews and things like that, right? So um, I made it very clear, and sometimes this is hard for new employees, I don't have that big of a staff, that, hey, I, I might have the title CTO, but at the end of the day, you know, I can I can make typos too, right? And I can make logic blunders. And and don't be afraid to point that out, right? You're not going to get yelled at because you tell the boss he, he made a mistake, right? I'd much rather that um, you point it out and say, hey, you know, this could be better. Or did you really mean to do that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's get a test around it make sure it works. So I... I always had an issue through my career with what I call the ivory tower architect, right? They, um, they failed up to their level of incompetence and they read a bunch of books and throw out big terms that they read in some magazine without actually living it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now I, I, I still have to delegate at times and that's probably the hardest thing for me to do in this position is to delegate and to step back. Um, we, we, we moved from Signal R to Azure Signal R recently because we had to do a scale out. Mm -hmm. And typically throughout my career, I'd be the one diving and learning it, right? And, and be all over it and like, I need to learn this technology. And I had to step back and, you know, trust my tech lead, right? I made him tech lead for a reason. And, you know, he's like, I'll get it done. I'm like, all right. Yeah, that was twitchy. And I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh, I need to be involved. But no, he did a great job. Um, so I think that's the two things, right? So you should never do, you know, should never ask your people to do something you wouldn't be willing to do yourself, right? You know, get right in there with them and, and write, you know, help them write the code that needs to be written. But you also need to trust your people, right? You have them in, in their positions for a reason. And obviously that trust grows, right? Brand new hire, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to, bet the farm on them necessarily, but you have to trust them more and more, right? Give mm -hmm. more and more responsibility and help them to grow. Um, but yeah, you got to trust your instincts and you got to learn to delegate. And, and that, for me, that's the hardest part, right? Yeah. That whole delegation. Well, that's, that, that's good advice because I think over the last 20 years, the number of people out there programming in our industry has doubled two or three times. And, Correct. and when you have that type of massive growth, you also have the need for, I'll use the generic word, programming leadership of all of its various types. And there's one, there's a huge need. Two, there's not enough people to actually fill the need. And there's going to be tons of opportunity for young programmers to kind of decide, you know what, maybe, maybe instead of just staring at my computer, maybe I do want to step into a you know, half leadership role of various kinds. Yeah, I give a I give a talk on leadership, and it's a keynote I've given all over the place, and I really enjoy giving it. It's soft skills, right? And it's leaders are 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 made, not born. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was first writing this talk for a conference over in Europe, and, and a buddy of mine, we we're building sets for my son's play. So this goes back oh, nice. a bunch of years, and he's like, "Why are you giving? You know, what do you know about leadership?" And I, I step back and I said, well, I've, I've had a boss my entire career. I've been a boss most of my career. Um, I've had awesome bosses. I've had really, really crappy bosses. I've, I know I've been a crappy boss and I'd like to think by now that I'm a kind of an awesome boss. I said, I've got a lot of just stories to tell and that's really what it is. But then people get you know, when they see the title, they're like, well, I'm not in management. And I'm like, well, you don't have to be in management. And, and honestly, the best leaders aren't in management, right? Because if you just look at self-forming teams, right, they're still going to have somebody who kind of steps forward as that, you know, that NCO, that, that leader who isn't anointed the leader, but helps keep the team moving in the right direction. You'll have to define and, and, NCO for some of our listeners. 
oh, non-commissioned officer, right? The the people who actually get all the work done. Um, and and the best thing about self-forming teams is you might have somebody who's you know takes the lead on certain parts of what a team needs to get done. You have somebody also take the lead on other parts that need to be done. But but even just you know if you've got an idea that you think is the right way to solve a particular issue, you know, part of that leadership is is getting getting your your team moving in the right direction, right? And and convincing them it's the right direction. Right. There's command and control, which almost always fails, right? Mm-hmm. Do this because I said so, right? Think of your parents or if you're a parent, I know I, I remember when I caught myself the first time going, because when my, my child asked why, and he's like, because I'm your father, because I said so. I'm like, that's like the worst off, you know, answer ever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, because I'm the architect, you know, that, that just doesn't fly. Right. That just, you know, uh, leads to revolt. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's all kinds of leadership, right. And, and you're right. It, it, the days of, I want to get into writing software because I don't want to talk to people are over right nobody programs in isolation if you if you yeah. do then you're not growing right we used to joke and, and i'm going to say you're about the same age as i and we'll leave it at that <laughs> uh, but we used to joke about you know we're going to lock the developers up in a room and, and we have to make sure that the uh, bottom of the door has enough gaps so we can slide pizza in twice a day yeah. right so at least they have something to eat and, and any team that's working in isolation and that is destined to fail, right? Because you don't have that rapid feedback loop. You don't have that communication. So, you know, you've got to get out there and you've got to talk to people. Yeah. Likewise, you know, there's companies who are like, well, the developer should never talk to the business. I'm like, okay, now you're destined to fail as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Why are you building these barricades? And there's, there's a fine line there. Right. You certainly don't want the business constantly going straight to developers saying, I need, I want. Right. Because then that that trips up priorities. It 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 makes them squirrel, you know, and get distracted and things like that. But you certainly don't want to have this artificial barrier where, you know, it's the office space problem, right? I bring the requirements to the developers. Uh, people skills. Uh, yeah, I got mad people <laughs> skills. You don't understand. Um, because when there's a question, I want my, my engineers going to, you know, the, the, the person who requested it, Hey, you asked for this report. I don't really understand these data points. You know, can we discuss? And unfortunately now, because, you know, we're remote, that means a meeting, right. As opposed to, Hey, let me stop by your office. Let me stop by your cube and talk about it. But now it's, we got scheduled zoom, Mm -hmm. right. But that's the world we live in. Right. And we use Teams a lot for that, for these impromptu. Hey, can I just call you on Teams, right? Because yep. what I like about that is it doesn't seem as formal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? It's still just a communication platform. You're still calling somebody remotely. But at least in our org where, you know, unfortunately, I am in a ton of meetings, um, as most C-suite people are, um, just pinging on on Teams, it's like, hey, here's, here's the, uh, I'm going to stop by your office. Yeah. Right. As opposed to we're going to get a conference room. Right. Yeah. Tons of tons of them are doing Slack. Slack has the video stuff integrated now, too. And I, yeah, I think that's the way it's going. When you think about professional C sharp, just diving into the language, one observation I have is, and I want to understand how you kind of coach your people and how you describe it. I remember 20 years ago, there was lots of industry debate and discussion, user groups, conferences about object-oriented programming. And now, you know, the cloud has kind of sucked so much of the talk space in our industry about, you know, cloud this and cloud that and a lot of stuff going on. But what is your view on object-oriented programming in the modern C-sharp? Well, I mean, it's it's really important. It's foundational, right? The problem that we can get into is going overboard with it, right? How many how many base classes do you want to derive from this and how deep do you want your inheritance chain to be? And again, I go back to just because you can doesn't mean you should. And and there's, you know, even, even in some of our code bases currently, I look at things and go, Oh my gosh, if I have to pull out the class diagram capability in visual studio, 
we probably did it wrong. Too big? Class too is too big? big. Yeah. Uh, well, not only just the class is too big, but also just the the hierarchy. Mm, yeah. Right. You know how deep you want to go. Um, in in data access land, I typically have at most three in the hierarchy chain. Right. And I know there's more the OO than just inheritance. inheritance, but but inheritance is where we seem to fall down the most. But I've got my base entity that has my ID and my my row version. Um, you know, and then the last modified date and created date and those types of things. And then, you know, we might have most projects will have, you know, that and then your entity. And then sometimes there'll be one more, um, but I find that hard. But where we tend to get lost is overdoing interfaces mm -hmm. and, um, you know, too deep of a hierarchy chain. Once you get too deep in a hierarchy chain, you start introducing, you know, I don't know if the butterfly effect is the right term for it, but I make this small change here and all of a sudden I brought the app crashing down because of too many side effects, mm. right? Um, what the butterfly flaps its wings and the price of milk goes up, something like that. Um, and, and it's really hard for us to visualize as humans, you know, the effect of that if we go down that that rabbit hole. But interfaces too have gotten really, really, I don't know if interesting is the right word because I, I feel like Microsoft moved my cheese and I'm I'm an old person struggling with this, right? Interfaces were supposed to be this contract. And now we have default implementations, you know, mm, within interfaces, yeah. and we've got you know the static capability with interfaces. And I, I, I always felt like it, an interface was just a vehicle. Well, first of all, you need it. You absolutely have to have interfaces for dependency injection, which is vital in the .NET Core, .NET world, right? especially in ASP.NET Core. If you don't understand DI, then, mm -hmm. then you're going to struggle. Um, but we can overdo interfaces too, right? You know, I, I love the, the, the concept in Solid where you know, the interface segregation, right? Make your interfaces just as small as you need. And and what I find myself doing is if I find that the interface is too big, it typically means the class is too big as well, mm -hmm. right? And so let's split that up. Well, you can't always split it up, right? Technical debt is, is interesting in that you don't always have to pay it back. You probably should, um, but there's also some that doesn't matter, right? You know, if you ship the software and there's technical debt in it and it's working, you're not going to go back into it. Do you need to go fix it? From a pride standpoint, I want to, but from a business ROI standpoint, no. But if you're working in this code base on a frequent basis and you're you know, the people using your code are like, I don't know which interface to use, mm -hmm. then you've got a problem, right? So the OO concepts are still very, very important. Um, Andrew wrote some great chapters on, on OO in the book. I've, you know, kept them up to date with the latest changes, but yeah, I, I, I don't think you can do effective C-sharp or professional C-sharp to coin the term, uh, without understanding OO. A detail that you just kind of mentioned really, really quickly. And I want to probably recognize that there's probably a lot of listeners out there that are saying, wait, wait, what is that? You said you, your entity base class has your ID and your row version. Why the row version? Because I know that there's tons of developers out there that need to hear that. Yeah, so so a really nice feature built into Entity Framework Core or EF Core is the idea of concurrency checking. And so we only use SQL Server, so I can't speak to the other database platforms, but in SQL Server, there's this concept of row version or timestamp where when a record gets added, uh, this field is maintained by SQL Server. And it's it's not a timestamp like a date and time. It's the number of clock ticks after some point in time, probably 1-1-1970, which is when the, the, the computer world really seems to have begun. And then every time that that record gets updated, that row version field also gets updated. So it's handled... Main, you know, automatically by SQL Server. So what EF Core does, if you identify one of your properties as a timestamp, then it will use it for concurrency checking. 
And so that's why it's in our base entity, right? Because we always want concurrency checking turned on. So what happens is let's say Jeff is looking at a customer and I'm looking at a customer in our app. And so we we both pull this customer back. And the row version or timestamp value is one, two, three. It's a much bigger than number than that. But let's mm -hmm. just go with one, two, three, because that's simple. And Jeff then saves the record, right? The timestamp is now one, two, four. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I go to save the record. And what EF Core has done since I've identified this as a row level concurrency check, it updates the query, the T SQL, to say instead of update customer set name equals fill where ID equals five, it includes a timestamp in the work clause. So what happens mm -hmm. is, you know, update customer set name equals fill where ID equals five and row version equals one, two, three. Now, Jeff has already updated customer with an ID of five. And so one, two, three doesn't exist. It's one, two, four. So then what happens is SQL Server reports back zero records updated, mm -hmm. right? This is not an exception in SQL Server. It's just, hey, you know what? You didn't do anything. So EF Core looks at this and the change tracker says, whoa, hold on. I expected one change. I didn't get any. So what happens is there's a DB update concurrency exception thrown. And that is the official name for what happened in the database doesn't match what the change tracker thought should happen in the database. And when this gets thrown, then we can handle it as developers. Now, how you handle it completely depends on your business, right? The, the first thing you want to do is throw that exception so that I don't overwrite what Jeff did, right? It's the principle of least surprise. Jeff should not be surprised when he reopens customer five and sees the name is Phil when he just set the name to Jeff, right? Wait a minute. I know I just saved this. What happened, mm -hmm. right? And I shouldn't be surprised that I've updated something, right? I don't get surprised by Jeff. Maybe Jeff's my boss and says, hey, you messed up the customer, right? He's our number one customer. So minimally, you want that exception thrown. Now, from there, you can do a whole bunch of different things, right? Uh, the easy answer is, uh, sorry, somebody else has updated this record. You need to retry. And you reload the page for them, and then they try again. Uh, you can also go as complicated as uh, it's a row level concurrency check, but part of what you get in this exception is the object that threw the exception or objects, I should say, it could be plural. So I could go through as a developer and say, well, Jeff updated the last name, Phil updated the first name. This really isn't a concurrency issue. I'm going to reload the record. I'm going to take the changes that Phil made. I'm going to apply them again. I'm going to silently succeed because they didn't actually step on each other's toes. And you get that when well, you get the concurrency checking just by turning on that timestamp slash row version capability in EF Core. Yeah. Well, that was a great, great explanation. There's so many, as I've gone through, there's, there's so many things that I find myself talking about, and of course, you know, hearing you talk about that we go past, oh yeah, years ago, we kind of went deep and figured out, oh yeah, this is just how you want to do it 80% of the time. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> well, and that's, that's true because, you know, you'll, you'll beat your head against the desk for a week to try and solve something, and then you solve it, and then... 98% of developers do this. You'll, you know, somebody will ask you, Hey, how'd you do that? And you go, Oh, that was easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You know, it wasn't at I the mean, time. When, when, once you solve it, right. Then it's easy. Right. But, but getting there is, it can be hard. So you're right. You know, we, we tend to, as, as old timers gloss over things that um, people are like, wait a minute, what, what did you just say? That's not important. So. Yeah. And you had mentioned that the, the solid principles and, class is too big. I don't know if you were in that discussion last week or, or not, but it was a talk about refactoring and when to know if you've refactored and, and what the mindset should be. And I remember one of the, one of the people in the discussion said, when you refactor, you want the end product to be what you would have made it if you had been going for this design from the beginning. I don't know if, hmm. that, if that's, if that's clear. Yeah, I guess my only concern, I was in, I was in the morning session, not the second session. Um, my only, my concern about that is 
I, I almost feel like that presumes that you have to refactor all the way if you're going to refactor. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm okay with taking those baby steps. Yeah. Right. You know, the Boy Scout principle, I'm going to clean up. It'll be cleaner than I found it, mm -hmm. but it might not be the cleanest. Yeah. If you can't get it all the way that you'd like it to be. Because technical debt can be subjective at times as well. Like I might perceive, oh, I got this technical debt and somebody else is like, no, it's fine. Yeah, and that's, you know, I always joke around, so technical debt serving the mortgage debt, you don't have to pay it back. Um, I mean, sometimes you do, and sometimes it comes back to bite you. Um, but, you know, a great quote from Scott Guthrie decades ago at an MVP summit, he said, you know, shipping is a feature, mm -hmm. right? And you can have the most perfect code and never get out the door, and then you're not making any money. Yeah, right, or you're true. not helping your your employees or whatever your the goal of your software is, and so sometimes you just have to get her done, mm -hmm. right? And I know that you know the the PST in me goes no, right? The professional scum <laughs> trainer was like, you know, get her done so bad, but there are times when it's like, you know what? I just need to ship this, right? You know, the company's bleeding money because we don't have a product that does this. Let's get it right. out the door, and. You know, it, it could be a bunch of people in the back room typing on keyboards to, you know, to respond to um, to orders as the first release, but at least you're making some money, right? And then right. we're like, oh, yeah, we need to automate that. Yeah. And and so you just, you know, you iterate through that. It's that emerging design that we always strive for. Yeah. Well, as we get to our, our time here and, and close up, especially for those, you know, maybe who can travel or close. You run Cincy Deliver. Will you tell us about that? Yeah. So it started off as the Cincy Day of Agile. And it just started off, you know, I've been doing this, I think this was coming up on our 15th year. And it was never just a process conference, right? It was a mix of, of process and technical, you know, and everything else. And then so I renamed it five years ago, maybe it was pre-pandemic you know it's funny how we always measure time now before or after <laughs> the pandemic and I, I changed it to since you deliver because really the conference has always been about delivering software it's not just a bunch of hey is scrum better than safe is it better than lean type thing it's hey let's talk about these processes but also let's talk about engineering concepts let's talk about testing right and team dynamics and soft skills so it's the last friday in july um, it is a nonprofit and, you know, um, CFP will come out here probably, I don't know when this will get published. Uh, so it's always a time travel thing when you do a podcast, but look for Q1 for the, the CFP and it's cincydeliver.org. I don't use sessionize because they charge you money. Mm. Um, and one of the nice things about my conference from an attendee perspective is it's $55 to get in. Oh, right. Nice. I've done everything I can to make it as cheap as possible to make it a true community event. Right. Um, I make no money. It's a labor of love for me. Um, but the venue costs money. Right. I got to feed the mm -hmm. people. And uh, that's the most expensive part. 90 percent of the budget is the food. Yeah. Right. I've got some great sponsors to help defray that. It actually cost me a little over 100 bucks a person to put the show on. But my sponsors have been awesome. Yeah. Right. And come through. But it's the last Friday in July. Um, okay. It's always the last Friday in July. I've, I moved to that, so we have a regular cadence. And like I said, just go to cincydeliver.org um, or just hit me up on Twitter at Ski Medic. And that's ski as in snow ski, medic as in paramedic, not schematic like a database design. I'm a retired firefighter paramedic and still active with the National Ski Patrol as a ski medic. So hence the moniker. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good. Well, good. A lot of great information. I appreciate you uh, coming on the show and sharing with us about professional C Sharp and .NET and lots of other goodies. Yep. Yep. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Awesome. My pleasure. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.